Now, let's review the byproducts of the ABC analysis. A indicates the key major benefit, reduce inventory through vendor stocking programs. Uh, B is the input into cycle counting. C is the input into vendor lead time analysis. And let me address that. Uh, as a, a byproduct of cycle counting, you're going to count so many A's, B's, and C's each day. On critical parts, you could have those uh, vendor names with the associated parts that they supply you with, and you could uh, uh, review the vendor lead time through a telephone call uh, or through the fax or any other particular application. C is the input into uh, a vendor lead time, which I've just identified. Uh, D is the input into a priority program, and that basically pertains to processing, uh, receiving orders, or filling orders from the storeroom. Uh, the concept is the A items should be processed first, followed by the B, and last followed by the C items. And uh, the last uh, input is uh, into the obsolescence program where anything that is zero usage, as I said before, is going to be at the bottom of uh, your ABC analysis listing. But remember, I'm not indicating that they're obsolete. I said it's the input into an obsolescence program. The true way to determine obsolescence is by having that uh, spare parts where used list. If you have parts in the storeroom and they're not reflected on the spare parts where used list, then those parts are truly candidates for obsolescence. Uh, starting off on page 17, we're addressing the cycle counting program. And uh, the uh, procedures uh, are very simple. Uh, the company must process an ABC analysis, which is step one. And as a byproduct of uh, the ABC analysis, uh, we want to identify the number of counts for the A, B, and the C items, and those are reflected in step number three. And incidentally, these number of counts have been approved by the certified public accounting profession. Now, if you feel that these counts are inadequate, in other words, you feel you would like to count certain items more frequently. All you have to do is to change the frequency code of cycle counting. So the A items must be counted a minimum of four times a year, the B items twice a year, and the C items once a year. Uh, prior to establishing the cycle count program, as step number four indicates, you want to take a physical inventory. And now you make all of your record adjustments, and we're assuming that our inventory record bin on hand is accurate because it reflects the physical that we have just taken. Item number five addresses the storeroom security. If the storeroom is not going to be secure 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, uh, then my recommendation is don't start cycle counting until you are in a secure environment. Uh, you must record uh, daily when the transactions occur, all of the receipts, the bin location numbers, the issues, and the consolidations. The consolidations is putting two or more locations into one. Uh, once the uh, cycle count program has been developed each day. So many A's, B's, and C items will be actually uh, issued from the cycle count program, and uh, that is addressed in step number seven. Continuing on now to page 17B, the cycle count uh, quantity is recorded on the form by the storeroom personnel taking the cycle count, and then the cycle count uh, quantity that is recorded is compared to the inventory record. Now, 
the CPA profession has likewise established parameters of accuracy. The A items, as indicated in step 11, must be 99.5% accurate. That is, count to the bin on hand. The B items must be 99.0% accurate, and the C items must be 95.0% accurate. If we are outside of that accuracy range, then that cycle count is rejected, and the cycle count should be retaken. Continuing now on page 17C, uh, one of the responsibilities of the cycle counter is to determine if an error is actually found, what caused the error. Remember, what we're trying to do is to get the highest degree of record accuracy so that we can support the maintenance work order planning and scheduling system through the inventory, the purchasing, and subsequently the storeroom program. After there has been a reconciliation uh, between the inventory system and the cycle count quantity, then the uh, cycle count form uh, should be uh, returned or forwarded to the financial department. And here the financial department uh, may cost out any variances and they may post those variances to what is called a cycle count variance record. Uh, if you do cycle counting for one year, then you take a second physical inventory and you should be within the accuracy ranges as we have indicated before relative to the A, B, C items. If they are within that range, you could drop the physical after that and continue cycle counting. Uh, one of the things that uh, you may want to uh, consider uh, is uh, uh, the uh, use of the uh, maintenance stores program that we have as uh, another uh, educational program. It's uh, one of our seven courses and uh, that is uh, identified at the bottom of page 17C. And here we actually go into the cycle count application as it is really done by the uh, storeroom personnel. All we're trying to do with section number four here is to address the key inventory uh, requirements to support the PM program. Now if we uh, turn to page 17D, well, we're going to develop what we call the cycle count workload. It's almost like capacity planning. In this case, uh, we indicate we have 500 A items, 1500 Bs, and 3000 Cs. That gives us a total of 5000 part numbers. Uh, now remember, all part numbers are not in stock all the time. They better not be. We're trying to reduce inventory. But this exhibit will indicate the maximum workload for the storeroom. We're going to take the minimum counts as uh, provided by the CPA profession, and we're therefore going to multiply that count by the number of items that are in the inventory system. And if you see over on the right-hand side, we're going to count uh, 2,000 A items over a year, 3,000 Bs, and 3,000 Cs. We therefore have a total projected annual count of 8,000 counts. And if you turn to page 17E, we're going to divide the total count by 250. That 250 indicates we're working 50 weeks per year, five days per week. We're allowing for holidays and so forth. And that means we're going to cycle count 32 items each day. And uh, the bottom uh, calculations on exhibit uh, 17E indicates the number of A, B, and C items that we're going to count. And again, their maximum counts are divided by 250. So each day, eight A items are going to be 
uh, listed on the cycle count form, 12 Bs and 12 Cs. Uh, generally, it takes about five minutes to cycle count one item. So for 34 minutes, you can multiply that by five, divide that sum by 60, and you'll see that you need a little over two hours uh, to uh, cycle count 34 items per day. It's not a full-time job on a daily basis, but it requires daily okay, uh, activity relative to cycle counting. Every day you miss cycle counting, you've got that additional workload of 34 items coming up on a cycle count form. So like uh, preventative maintenance, it's a scheduling discipline. Cycle counting is also a scheduling discipline uh, within the storeroom. Now, uh, on page uh, 18, we've identified all of the byproducts of the ABC analysis. And uh, we've indicated that there are seven. I said all. Uh, companies may have more, but these are all that we have uh, been associated with working with uh, companies like yourself. First of all, we've identified the ABC items by their code. Uh, we have developed the input into cycle counting. We've developed the input into inventory investment. Uh, we have uh, used the ABC code uh, to uh, keep on top of vendor lead times. It can likewise be used. Step number five is the priority system. And step six is an obsolescence program. Periodically, I have people ask me, Frank, can we lay out the storeroom by ABC code? Now, you notice I say input into a store's layout program, uh, item number seven. My answer is no. Don't lay out the storeroom by uh, ABC code. Lay the storeroom out by commodity code. That means all part numbers within a commodity or family are going to be in the same location in the storeroom. That is the uh, most expedient way to lay out the storeroom, and it eliminates a lot of people spending a lot of time trying to find parts. All the parts for a family in the storeroom are in one general area. Now what I would like to do uh, is starting on page 19, look at the derivation of some of these inventory control techniques. You know, if you go back to the beginning of section four, uh, we've uh, indicated that uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, so many different inventory control techniques that you should consider in the inventory management program. We've developed the inventory ordering matrix with those inventory techniques. We've uh, looked at some specific applications on how the inventory technique was actually used uh, in the inventory management program. Here, we're gonna look at how that uh, individual technique was actually derived. And I think when we go through this, you should have a fairly good understanding of how to use the technique, when to use it, when not to use it, and how you can develop your order quantities and safety stock based upon the parameters for each and every part number in the inventory system. Again, on page 19, we are showing the uh, EOQ formula. On uh, page uh, 20 and 21, we're going to look at the derivation of the carrying costs and uh, the uh, individual uh, purchase order costs. Now that little fulcrum that you see there in this balancing scale, I'll explain that in a minute. The cost associated with carrying inventory really comes from the financial records and that percentage of inventory carrying costs should be provided by the financial department to you. But here are the data elements that make up the carrying cost. Insurance on our assets, that is the inventory assets, the taxes we pay on the assets, 
the obsolescence value, if you truly have an obsolescence program, the cost to acquire the capital, that's the cost to borrow money, and the last is the storage cost to maintain the storeroom in its facility. That would include a percentage of taxes and maintenance on the building. It would also include a percentage of uh, power consumption for light and any uh, heat or air conditioning uh, that may be uh, you know, uh, of involved in maintaining the storeroom. Now, if I go to the next page, uh, 21, I'm looking at the cost that comprise the purchase order cost. Remember, the uh, setup cost comes from manufacturing, and we take the setup time, multiply it by the labor cost, and that gives us the setup cost. But in the purchase order cost, we have uh, a few other uh, items to consider, such as the annual cost to maintain the purchasing department. That's every cost associated, which includes salaries and all other associated costs. The same applies to the receiving department, the receiving inspection department, and if any data processing costs are associated currently uh, supplying data processing support for these, through area, for these three areas, then we want to add that prorated portion to the annual uh, purchase, receiving, and receiving inspection costs. I add up all four of those costs and divide by the number of purchase orders I'm going to issue over one year. That gives me my average PO cost. We drop the word average and we basically make reference to that cost as the purchasing order cost. Now, if I were to superimpose the carrying cost page on top of the uh, purchase order cost page, and those two costs were balanced at every point in time, then I would have what we call the most economical order quantity by part number. That is when the carrying cost by part number is equal to the purchase order cost by part number, I have the most economic order quantity. Well, that's a lot of work to go through if I've got thousands of parts in the storeroom. There has to be an easier way. Well, there is. And to show you how that was derived, if you would turn to page uh, 22, we're going to walk through a little scenario relative to how the EOQ was developed. Uh, first of all, uh, we're going to select an item that has an annual usage of $1,200. We have S is the purchase order cost of a dollar, make it easy for us, and a carrying cost of 10%. Now what we've done is we've established five different ordering criteria. Semi-annually, quarterly, uh, bi-monthly, monthly, and semi-annually, or semi-monthly. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, the order quantity is actually derived by taking the number of orders, which is the third column from the right, and dividing those figures into the uh, annual usage value of $1,200. OQ, the second column from the left, is order quantity. So if I divided two into $1,200, I would have a $600 order quantity and so forth. The average inventory is one half of the order quantity. So all I do is I take the order quantity and divide it by two. The assumption is that when I bring a lot size into my storeroom, I'm going to have approximately one half the order quantity always on hand until I replenish okay, that particular item with another purchase. The uh, carrying cost is a byproduct of multiplying the average inventory by the carrying cost percent. So if I have an average inventory of $300 uh, for the semi-annual uh, procurement uh, program, 
and I multiply that $300 by 10% or 0 0.10, I get uh, $30. Since we have two orders per year under semi-annually, and a purchase order cost is $1 per order, then my purchasing cost, the second column from the right, is $2. And if I add the carrying cost of $30 to the purchase uh, cost of $2, I have the total cost of $32. And that's how that column on the right-hand uh, side is developed. Now, if you look down that right-hand column, you're going to see something peculiarly happening. Uh, as I increase the frequency of ordering, the lot size is going to go down, but the purchase order cost is going to go up. And you'll notice that I go from $32 to $19 to $16, but then as I increase the frequency of ordering, it starts to go up to $17, and ultimately the last uh, purchasing uh, requirement which is 24 orders a year, semi-monthly, I'm up to $26.50. So what has happened is the total cost comes down and then it comes back up again. So the most economical uh, quantity to purchase would be where the total cost is $16 and therefore I would order six times a year. Now, if we took the carrying cost column we took the purchase order cost column and the total cost column and we graphed those, we would have the uh, graph which is on 23. And uh, in this case, the straight line, it says acquisition cost. That is nothing more than another term which says cost to acquire. And in this case, it's the purchase order cost. We have that geometric curve on the bottom, uh, and it uh, identifies itself by maintenance cost. That's the cost to maintain inventory, which is another term for carrying cost. And then up on top, we have uh, that uh, big curve, and it's referred to uh, in uh, the mathematical circle as a parabolic curve, and uh, where that bottom of that Parabola lies is the most economic order quantity. Uh, where we had the fulcrum balanced between the purchase cost, the cost to acquire, and the carrying cost, when they're equal to one another, that's the most economic order quantity. So graphically, the acquisition cost, as you see, intersects the carrying cost or the maintenance cost. In that vertical line going up shows us that the lowest cost is at the bottom of that parabolic curve. Now that's nice graphically. We've gone through a lot of calculations on the previous exhibit, but how does that help us to generate the EOQ? Well, the straight line acquisition cost has a uh, equation. The unknown in the equation is order quantity. The maintenance cost curve has an equation. And the unknown is in the order quantity. When I take both of those equations and make them equal to one another, and I solve for, okay, the order quantity, I actually develop the economic order quantity and the EOQ formula is really the formula for this top curve called the parabolic curve. So you see, the EOQ was developed mathematically. It wasn't pulled out of the air. It's not a theoretical approach. It's really a financial approach. It is providing us with the order quantity where the cost to acquire and the cost to maintain or carry inventory are the lowest. And therefore, we call that the most economic order quantity. Now, moving on to the next uh, development of a formula, we're going to look at the order point. Now, the order point is equal to some type of usage times the lead time. And previously, we've been talking about average usage 
So I need average usage over uh, a lead time period. So what I want you to do is I want you to write the word average usage uh, or write the word average in front of that term usage. The reason I have you do that is some people have taken one usage over one lead time period and said that's part of the order point formula. It doesn't work that way. We have to look at usages over many, many different time periods, which we're going to show you how that was accomplished in a moment. The second half of the formula is plus the safety factor times MAD. Now we've I've gone through the development of an order point illustration, but I want to show you how the order point was developed. Uh, on the next page, 25, we have a series of uh, usage lines which actually come out of the OP up on the top of the exhibit here. These lines that come out are called usage lines. Uh, the lines that do not go into safety stock are called low usage periods. Some of the lines, the two lines that go into safety stock are high usage periods. And you notice we have one that goes below the safety stock and that says during a short period of time we were out of inventory. Now hopefully if there was no future unplanned requirement during that period of time and we got a replenishment lot in, all is not lost but at times that could happen. Now if we look at the left hand line which is the vertical line from the top to the bottom that line is called inventory on hand and a part of that inventory on hand is the safety stock. And if you were to take uh, and draw a line from the order point on top and go to the left until you hit the inventory on hand that would indicate that when my bin on hand reaches that level, which is the order point, which is calculated, I must order. And if you notice, we have that uh, line vertically below the order point. It has an arrow on the top and the arrow on the bottom. That starts the lead time. So we have a lead time line, which is a horizontal line. And that uh, vertical line that is going up uh, a little below the safety stock top level is a replenishment or a lot size or a purchase order quantity that I received. So here we have all of the data elements that are an integral part of the order point. The order point is equal to the average usage times the lead time plus safety stock. Safety stock, if you remember, is equal to mean absolute deviation times the safety factor. Now, where did that safety factor come from? It came from, as I indicated earlier, from a table. Now, on page 26, we're looking at what we call a safety stock service level curve. The vertical uh, column is safety stock. The horizontal line at the bottom is service level. And you notice that that curve goes up geometrically. It indicates to us that as we increase the service level, the safety stock is going to go up. Now, I want you to make a little note to yourself on this page. The, uh, that curved line on this exhibit seems to uh, top out at uh, the 100% service level. In other words, here's our service level curve, here's 100%. It actually doesn't touch. There is a void there, and that void signifies you cannot continuously have 100% service. And as you'll see from the following page on page 27, we have a service uh, level uh, safety factor uh, table. And this service level, uh, fact, uh, service level safety factor uh, table are for mean absolute deviation. The 
left hand column is service level it goes from 50 percent on the top all the way down to 99.99 percent at the bottom see it's not at a hundred percent these uh, values under MAD are not mean absolute deviation values they are the safety factors using MAD so not to confuse you you may want to make a note on this page that these values going from 0, 0.00 all the way to 5.00 are safety factors for their respective service level. You remember an, an order point example that you went through or I went through in the uh, previous pages of this section we had a 95 percent service level. If you read across from 95 percent going to the right you'll see the safety factor is 2.06. That's the same safety factor we used in our illustration of an order point system, which also helped in developing the safety stock. And this is where uh, you would determine the safety factor for a pre-selected service level. Now, one of the key things that is a byproduct of the where used listing is a where used code. Now this is the first time I'm mentioning this and I wanted to hold off and talk about the where used code until I came to page number 28. And if you turn to that page now, I'm going to uh, walk you through with what I call the safety stock ordering matrix and here's how it works starting off at the left the where used code is the number of places a spare part is used in uh, the first range is one to three assets then we go four to six and seven to eight and ten to twelve and greater than twelve the companies that we have worked with have decided that they never want to go below a 95 percent service level and therefore that service level percent column the center column is a byproduct of management decisions what kind of management maintenance management decisions so if we list the service levels then for these service levels I go back to page number 27 and I pick up the appropriate safety factors. So we're adding now a new dimension, if you will, to the use of the where use code. Uh, in addition to uh, processing, as an example, engineering change notices, supporting an obsolescence program, the where use code is now used as an input into the development of safety stock for future unplanned requirements. And the uh, concept of the uh, where use code and the service level is as follows. The higher the service level, the higher the probability that there's going to be a stock out. A stock out is a service level. So therefore, th we have now a consistent way uh, to generate safety stock using the where use code as a major input. One of the uh, applications uh, that sometimes we have a problem with in planning uh, PM work orders where we have a shop calendar uh, is noted on uh, the bottom of page 28 as a note. And this is tied in with the shop calendar. Let's assume that we have a PM work order and the frequency code is every 90 days. I'm supposed to have uh, a particular PM activity applied to that particular machine. But you notice in a note, it indicates that that time element uh, is uh, predicated uh, for operation of a one shift 40 hour week. So that means over a 90 day period I'm operating one shift 40 hours a week. 
if operations changes the operation schedule going from one shift to two shifts, that means I'm going to double, okay, the, the amount of uh, service for that machine. What does not happen in industry is when operations does that change from one to two shifts, maintenance is not notified. And that 90-day frequency code is waiting for a total of 90 days of elapsed time. The frequency code really should be changed to 45 days. I should divide that 90 days by two because I'm going to two shifts. If on the other hand, later they went to three shifts, I have to take that 45 days and cut that in half. So one of the key elements, when we have a shop calendar frequency code in our PM program, we must, and I can't overemphasize the must, coordinate changes in the production schedule with the frequency code which is used in the PM program. If, if you don't do that, you're going to start seeing that you're going to start increasing machine downtime, which is really not the byproduct of a good PM program. So remember, the shop calendar is going to be critical based upon the current frequency code you develop as opposed to the operation schedule that is used in manufacturing. Now, the uh, next uh, two pages addresses the min-max system. We've gone through the development of min-max, but some of the key issues in terms of how it is derived are listed on page uh, number uh, 29. Uh, the first element is lead time must be immediate. Well, in this case, immediate is, uh, let's say, one week or less. There must be some consistent usage. A few pieces a month is consistent, but two or three pieces spread out over one year is not consistent. And therefore, for that type of usage pattern, we may want to use that requirement in a strictly a planned environment. The minimum, if it is equal to one or more, is really your safety stack. It's your cushion in terms of reordering. Uh, if I had a supplier that could deliver parts within two to three days, uh, and I recognize what my historical usage uh, pattern has been, uh, I probably would use a, a min as zero. But if I have a supplier uh, that may be, you know, many, many miles away and we may have two or three days of transportation involved, then that minimum could be a three or a four day inventory level. There are no formulas to establish the min or the max. It's done with a little intuitiveness and good old common sense. The uh, max and the min, as I've just indicated in step four, are developed by you. The order quantity is the difference between the max minus the min, except where we have the min is equal to one or more, then it's the deviation below the min at the time of issue. So on the following page, I have uh, developed for you an illustration of how the min-max system actually works graphically where the min is greater, is equal to or greater than one. Now on page 31, we want to address an item that we had referred to earlier called a bench stock or two-bin system. And you notice here, I've inserted the word free. Uh, that's a third description uh, for this type of an application. If you recall, Bench stock, two bin system are those items that are carried in a repair shop uh, for uh, future repair orders provided by the maintenance organization. What the system is trying to do is to prevent maintenance personnel 
going to the crib and issuing out small quantities of inexpensive items. Therefore, we want to carry some inventory in the repair shops. That inventory is managed under the bench, stock, or two-bin system. The procedures are outlined on page 31. The first thing we want to do is to establish the part numbers that will uh, be an integral part of the bench stock program. Next, we want to develop the inventory quantities that we want to carry in the repair shop. My advice is to start off with a 30-day supply. In some cases, uh, 30 days may be adequate. In others, you may want to go to 45 days. I would try to stay away from going more than a, thir uh, than a 45 day supply. The, we want to establish the stocking location within the repair shop. And we want to determine how we're physically going to store that inventory. The most common method of storage is to use the carousels. Uh, in some cases, a carousel may not be conducive, so we may have a regular bin uh, in, the, in the repair shop and we would have little tote pans or tote containers that would carry the inventory. The next thing we want to do is to establish the method and how we're going to replenish the inventory. This is very, very easy. The storeroom personnel replenishes the inventory by going to the various repair shops, if you have more than one, actually physically eyeballs what's in the uh, container and notes on a replenishment order those parts that should be replenished. And, and um, page number 32 uh, indicates how we're going to actually track the replenishment quantity. We're going to track the usage we're going to develop the replenishment quantity. Again, this is by eyeball. And then we're going to track the vendor lead time to make certain that any inventory that is on hand in the storeroom, uh, when it gets to a low level like a min, that it's going to be replenished in sufficient time before we run out. And there may be a need to revise the bench stock quantities that is the inventory that is carried in the repair shop. Now on page 33 is the document we use that controls the issuance of the two bin items. Uh, in this case, this document is for the mechanical repair department. You'll also notice on the left hand top that these parts are going to go into roto bin number five and these parts specifically will go into Tier 5. Tier 1 on a roto bin system is always on the bottom, as is in a shelving system, Shelf 1 is always on the bottom. These part numbers and their description and quantity are identified on a tag, and they're actually, that tag is uh, put on the periphery of the roto bin. The person in the storeroom will have a clipboard, have several of uh, the documents uh, similar to uh, page 33, physically goes out to the repair shop, eyeballs what's left, makes a check mark uh, in the right hand column which says replace. I take this into the storeroom, I pull these items that are prepackaged uh, from the two bin section in the storeroom, take the material out to the repair shop, put it into the various uh, bins, come back and update the inventory record showing the disbursement. Now, you could eliminate this particular document in that manual issue by going either to a card or through a terminal by barcoding the entire system. And my advice is to barcode it so that the part number and the description as shown on page 33 is going to also have the barcode label. I do not need this document, page uh, 33. 
I merely go out with a handheld wand and wand the barcode for the parts that I'm going to replenish. I will take that uh, information and upload it uh, into my system, uh, let's say through a wand reader, and it will do two things simultaneously. It will print out the pick ticket for the items I only have to replenish, but most importantly, it updates the issue quantity at the same time. So whether you're manually, you're partially computerized, or you are in a barcode environment, that's a beautiful application for this bench stack or two bin system. Now, <clears throat> the next page illustrates where we have a decentralized storage area. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a little maintenance storeroom uh, in Department 14. Uh, this could be a multi-story building. It could be a one-story building. But these four departments are all together. And the items that are in that decentralized storeroom are the items that are generally used in these four departments. When a, a PM order is issued, any of the material that is in that uh, section or in that little what we call decentralized storeroom will be removed by the storeroom from its bin on hand record. And as the maintenance uh, craft person goes to that area, he or she has the key to get into that uh, decentralized storage area and by bin location that is on the PM work order, the material can be removed. <clears throat> that person doesn't have to do any recording, but make sure that that uh, uh, location door is locked and then the maintenance requirements according to the PM activity can be executed. The uh, next exhibit uh, indicates the difference between a vendor minimum and a vendor unit pack. And I just want to walk you through this little scenario because many times uh, the people in purchasing do not ask the right question. And I want to go through the exhibit first, and then we're going to define the right question. Uh, we have in our inventory record a lot of data, but the data that I'm looking at here, it says given, is that we're looking at a 20-day horizon. That means these are planned requirements, and that the minimum order quantity is 2,000 pieces. Now, the first scenario says over the 20-day planning horizon, I need 1,795 pieces. The vendor says the minimum uh, order quantity is 2,000. I'm going to have to purchase 2,000 pieces. And if you remember, we have an inventory class code that identifies vendor minimums. Now, in a second scenario, over another 20-day horizon, we have a requirement of 2,365 pieces. Uh, since the minimum is 2,000, we cut a purchase order for 2,365, order to order. But we get a phone call from the supplier, and the supplier says, I think you made a mistake. You have to order 4,000. Now, what went wrong? Why do we have to order 4,000? Our record says 2,000 is the minimum. Well. When purchasing received the data from the supplier, they forgot to ask the following question. So please write this question down uh, at the bottom of this page. Is 2,000 the vendor minimum or the vendor unit pack? That simple little question uh, will eliminate embarrassment with the supplier, but most importantly, we don't want to add that additional lead time while we're trying to straighten out uh, our records. So remember, is the uh, 2,000 the minimum or the unit pack? Then we can establish the proper inventory uh, control technique. Now, since we're talking about minimums and unit packs, 
and page 36 is the derivation of the supplier minimum. The minimums are established by the supplier. And if you notice in step number four, it is purchasing's responsibility to convey this information. Maybe what we ought to say is convey the proper information to the inventory system. And continuing on page 37, we have the supplier unit pack. And again, this is established by the supplier. And likewise, purchasing has the responsibility to make certain that it is a unit pack. They pass this information onto the inventory system. And here again, we, if it's properly executed, then we will execute the reordering of either the supplier minimum or the unit pack properly. Now, the next page, page 38, illustrates the steps required for the vendor stocking program. And this is an extremely uh, important application for you to understand and for you to exercise. Because if we could reduce, through vendor stocking, our inventory investment by 70 to 80 percent, if not more, through planning the PM and the major minor overhaul applications, what a wonderful return on investment. So the first step is to determine the part numbers that will be used in vendor stocking. The answer to that is maybe as many A's as practical and some B's. Establish the annual usage. We got that right off of our ABC analysis. Calculate the actual cost of all items. Well, we've done that. We've taken the cost in ABC analysis and we multiplied it by the usage. So we do have the annual usage, not value, but in this case, the anticipated annual usage purchases. If a part is critical and there is sufficient usage, uh, you may want to select two suppliers as noted in step four. The next step is to take all of our uh, annual usage projected uh, supply requirements and sit down with the supplier and negotiate uh, the pricing structure or negotiate cost reduction opportunities but most importantly negotiate that the vendor carries the inventory until we use it then we will pay for it and you see what we're doing is we're actually going to work with one vendor, sometimes two, with all of our annual usage value requirements. Uh, so continuing on with the program, uh, on uh, step number six on page 39, we're going to establish the reorder criteria. Now here again, a min-max system will work fine. What we have to do is to determine what is our minimum going to require? Is it going to require short or long transportation uh, from the supplier? And therefore we would establish our minimums accordingly and the maximums that we may want to establish uh, may be a one, two, or three week supply. We certainly don't want to go over that because don't forget we can replenish this on a periodic basis. We'll establish, like I said a moment ago, the uh, delivery uh, lead times. Uh, we want to make sure that the vendor tells us what his or her inventory levels are going to be that they're going to carry. And uh, then if we utilize data processing applications, uh, we could have a dial-up system where we could dial up directly uh, into the vendor a data processing bin on hand system, order parts, and then subsequently receive the parts. Uh, when we do that, as step number 10 indicates, we want to establish security codes. And also, before we really run with the entire system, we want to test it and then implement the system. And you should add number, step number 13. You may want to add additional parts 
as new uh, items are introduced into the uh, maintenance management program. And th that's covered on page 40 uh, with step number 14. Now, <clears throat> the uh, last exhibit in this section uh, identifies the benefits to both you and the supplier. First of all, uh, you don't have to interview supplier sales representatives. You've already established your goal for one year. You don't have to generate purchase orders. The storeroom actually is going to release against a predetermined purchase order and we use what we call the suffix, which merely indicates by numeric number, sequences of one, how many releases we have had against that purchase order by individual supplier. Uh, we don't have to have any more supplier quotations except for new items. We reduce the entire purchase order processing time, which eliminates purchase order processing costs. We don't have to expedite suppliers unless while we're looking at the supplier bin on hand through a computerized system, we recognize there could be a shortage or a back order. At this time, we want purchasing to follow up. Uh, we also reduce our inventory carrying cost, which is the largest contributor to cost reduction and last but not least, we're going to reduce our storage cost because we're going to be storing a very small quantity of inventory. The benefits are both for the supplier and you. We have established many, many stocking programs. I would say over 200 with many of our clients. And they're doing this with 8, 10, 12 different suppliers. The key is to make certain that you are going to use the items that are in the vendor stocking program for at least a minimum, but hopefully one year in advance. How do you determine that? Through planning. So in this section, section number four, what we've tried to do is to provide you with the tools for inventory management to support that external planning activity called inventory, purchasing, and the storeroom. In uh, section five, we're going to discuss the planning and scheduling of uh, PM. Uh, previously, at the beginning of this uh, seminar, I indicated that uh, we're going to separate the planning activity from the scheduling activity. Well, this is the section that that separation occurs. So if you would look at page number one, we're going to address the differences between planning and scheduling. And as you could see from the first paragraph, uh, planning supersedes scheduling. And what I've uh, done is to separate this section into the planning uh, portion and followed by the scheduling portion. So pages 2 to 15b are basically associated with the planning activity. And once planning has been accomplished, then we can schedule which uh, embraces the balance of the uh, material in section number five, and that's covered uh, from pages 16 to 31. So let's uh, continue now on page 2A and talk about the uh, planning process. You will notice in the uh, first paragraph, I have uh, tried to cross-reference previous data that we have covered relative to this planning outline. And that was covered to a certain extent in uh, page 4A, section 2. And you will find as we go through the balance of the notebook, because of the various planning and scheduling activities, that I actually 
uh, try and cross-reference the uh, previous pages that we have uh, discussed so it'll be easy for you to flip back and uh, forth, especially if you were taking notes on some of the previous sections and their related material. Now the first question that must be asked is what will we maintain? And basically uh, those answers uh, really come from section one or function one of the maintenance management program which we uh, covered in section one page four and four a and that really is the starting point of the entire PM the major and minor overhaul programs what must be done is likewise uh, answered in uh, the function one of the maintenance management program uh, most of this uh, information relative to what must be done should be supplied by the original OEM of the e asset and remember we've covered that in previous sections or it's something that you're going to have to develop uh, through your own uh, data uh, or historical data. Uh, how long will it take is predicated upon the actual functions within the PM and the minor uh, or major activities. Now there are no industrial engineered standards that I know of out in the marketplace uh, relative uh, to your particular maintenance requirements. There are publications, there are governmental publications, there are some MTM uh, method time motion study standards, but my uh, experience indicates that the easiest way to implement PM and address the question how long will it take is to develop a detailed worksheet and remember uh, we looked at a worksheet uh, we start off with the sequence number the description uh, that is what has to be done in that sequence and then we estimate the time and if you do this step by step properly you'll find that you'll be able to develop those incremental time periods and then go through a summation of all of the steps or sequence numbers and then you'll have a total for that uh, particular PM activity. Once that PM order has been released uh, through the scheduling system and the craft personnel uh, actually perform their work, it is through the process of clocking in and out on the PM work order which gives us the opportunity to compare the actual time against the estimated time. And <clears throat> we've discussed this earlier. What's the feedback that I want from my uh, maintenance personnel? Well, first of all, we want the time on the job. And then if you remember, we're looking at observations, findings, and recommendations for operating improvement. So continuing on now to page 2B, uh, we want to talk about how often will we perform the task. Now, this is uh, covered on page 15 of section 2. And again, uh, it should be uh, developed by the original OEM. However, there are, you know, four inputs uh, relative to how often we will perform the task. And if you remember, I refer to these as frequency codes. Uh, to refresh our memory, the first one is the shop calendar. Uh, the second could be odometer readings on a uh, moving stock. The third would be uh, the machine hours generated by operations. And the fourth would be the input from the uh, predictive maintenance program. Who will perform the task? Uh, it's quite easy. Uh, what particular operation is required on the PM and that basically dictates the task. Is it for an electrician? Is it a for an electronic uh, tech, uh, mechanic, a millwright, and so forth? And that's one of the reasons that it is important to develop the uh, craft names and the associated craft number. So this <coughs> a craft number is going to be used all through the PM, the major and minor overhaul. That's the planning process. When we schedule the order, then you're going to assign a specific craft person 
to that order by badge number, or there could be a group requirement, and more than one person would be assigned that particular task. Uh, what will be required, you know, to perform the task? Think about the four uh, basics. Uh, we have the spare parts required, uh, if there are any required, and remember lubrication is uh, treated like a spare part. Then we will have uh, such things as the equipment, the tooling, and the documentation that is required. Now these six questions uh, should be embedded in the mind of the individual that is going to perform uh, the PM planning and scheduling tasks. And after a, a few days on the job, it's going to be very apparent that that uh, starts to be an uh, in integral part of your memory bank. Now, <clears throat> moving on to page uh, 3A, we want to discuss the different uh, PM functions. Uh, we actually uh, have uh, broken this down into uh, different applications. First of all, you'll notice that there is a note and it indicates that other than the PM personnel, we can use machine operators. Uh, we can likewise use, uh, let's say, forklift truck operators, over the road operators, even though they may not be uh, considered a machine operator by title. Anyone that is going to operate an asset should be considered as a candidate for uh, the TPM program, the Total Productive Maintenance Program. And it, it really should be considered at the beginning of the PM program. And this is going to require the coordination and the cooperation between maintenance management and other management personnel in the organization. Uh, we have uh, covered the maintenance management PM functions, uh, which is listed in uh, uh, paragraph uh, 4 on page 3A, and that was covered on page 11, section 2. So you see, as I indicated before, I don't want to repeat a lot of the data, but I'm giving you the cross-referencing so you can go back to those particular documents, uh, reread them, if you will, in a notebook, and then have those become an integral part of the PM program. Uh, on the last paragraph on page uh, 3A, we want to consider, as I've indicated earlier in the program, the separation of dynamic PM to static PM. A dynamic PM are those functions or operations that can be performed while the asset is in operation. Uh, the static PM says that the asset must be in a non-operative condition. The reason for this, and if you remember I've explained it previously, it's the easiest way to integrate the PM planning and scheduling process with the operations planning and scheduling process. The uh, uh, <coughs> paragraph on page 3 uh, addresses uh, those particular activities. The two major benefits derived through the PM work order system relative to dynamic and uh, secondly to static is the integration of those two applications. Now, uh, if you remember, when we looked at uh, page number one in section one, we identified six different uh, maintenance management programs. At some point in time, and believe me, this is going to be the latest state of the art in planning and scheduling, especially in a manufacturing operation. The integration of maintenance and operation planning and scheduling. If you do this properly up front, that uh, uh, blending of those two activities into one planner scheduler doing both is going to be very, very easy to accomplish. And turning now uh, to page uh, number four, we're talking about the different uh, PM requirements. And again, 
This is not a duplication of data, but we are now in the development of the PM planning process. First, we're talking about all of the PM activities. An integral part of the PM activities includes the major and minor overhauls. If you also remember, we said projects are also planned requirements. Now, projects should be actually planned through the maintenance organization because in many cases, you're going to use craft labor. This also gives the planner scheduler uh, when he or she is planning projects to not, not only identify the labor requirements, but also the inventory requirements of spare parts. At some point in time, uh, when those planned projects are complete, the uh, project itself, whatever that asset happens to be, may be introduced into the PM program. The learning curve for the planner scheduler has already been accomplished through the integration of projects in the planning process. So uh, blend those projects into the planning and scheduling function up front, get that learning experience of the project into the system, and once all of the data is completed, you'll have your PM major minor overhauls for those particular projects. Now, moving on to the PM work order time elements. Uh, we have three pages here, pages 5A, B, and C, and they uh, define the various time elements. And these are the data elements that I referred to uh, a few minutes ago in the beginning of uh, section number five, and that is the estimated time per time element. So let's take our time and go through these time elements and make certain we thoroughly understand who's going to perform those tasks and how long should it take to perform a task. The first one is preparation time. Preparation time is a function of the storeroom. Uh, that is the uh, development of obtaining all of the equipment and identifying equipment by part number, description, unit of measure, and tying that equipment in with the PM work order number. If there are special tools, uh, equipment, and documentation required, it's up to the storeroom to, uh, again, apply those three requirements to the work order. Now, who should estimate the time for preparation time? It really should be the responsibility of the storeroom, not the planner scheduler, because the planner scheduler may not understand all of the detail and the time elements associated with that. So here the planner scheduler is gonna get support, if you will, to develop the first time element for the first operation or sequence number on the PM work order. Now the travel time uh, to the job site uh, can be estimated. Uh, in many cases, uh, the planner schedule will actually walk uh, the uh, mile, if you will, uh, to the job site and determine approximately what the estimated time is. Uh, again, this is not a, in, uh, a engineered time standard approach. It's an estimated approach. And when we look at the actual work order time, that is, I call it the wrench time and step number three, here we have to break that down into individual uh, detailed steps. Uh, as an illustration, the first step may be a lockout procedure uh, to prevent any uh, injury or harm to the PM person. There may be a dismantling, let's say, of an end plate where I may have to uh, change bearings. Uh, to determine the dismantling time, we'd have to know approximately how many, let's say, bolts we're gonna pull off of the end plate, remove the gasket, the gasket is gonna have to be replaced, uh, pull the bearing with the bearing puller, that's a tool, and uh, look at the shaft that the bearing is on, now, see, those are individual time elements. 
And that's the type of detail you want to go through to develop the appropriate time. And uh, once that is completed, as I said previously, the PM person uh, will be clocking in and out on that wrench time. And then we can compare the aggregate time estimated to the aggregate time actually on the job. Part of the feedback, if you remember, from the PM people uh, is to actually review the steps, make sure that the steps are in proper sequence, are there any steps that are not required, are some uh, steps omitted, and we need to give some time to the uh, PM person uh, to go through that analysis, and at least that's got to be considered when we initially start up the PM program. Uh, any uh, notes, uh, any notification of changes should be put on the PM uh, order itself by the PM uh, person. And uh, once that's completed, then that data gets funneled back to the planner scheduler. It can be reviewed uh, by the uh, supervisor of maintenance. Uh, the changes can be made if changes should be made. And the next time uh, that that PM activity is released, again, we have another opportunity to try and zero in to what I call finitely develop more accurate estimated times and they therefore become the standards for that particular PM operation. And uh, step number four on the bottom of page uh, 5B, we're talking about the travel time back to the job site uh, and from the job site back to the maintenance operation. Now a little later when we get into scheduling you're going to see we have two types of scheduling systems. One is called sequential scheduling, where we have two or more uh, PM orders that are going to be performed by, let's say, a PM person in sequence. We also have another scheduling technique, which is something that we have designed, and that is called sequential overlap scheduling. When we go into sequential overlap scheduling, you're going to find that you can earn more maintenance PM hours with less time actually going into the job. When you first set up the PM program, make certain that you have the prep time, the travel to the job site, and the travel from the job site. Because when we go into sequential overlap scheduling, the uh, PM person may not have as much travel from the job site back to, uh, let's say, the maintenance uh, department. When we get into that section, we're going to look at that in great detail because I promise you, if you follow what I have developed in a notebook and what we're going to discuss, we'll give you the ability to generate more earned PM hours by actually putting less time into the uh, tasks. Now, the uh, last uh, page, uh, or uh, last item on page 5C uh, is the uh, development of the PM work order itself. Uh, in many company uh, programs, uh, the uh, crib, the storeroom personnel, May, be, may deliver material to the job site. And it is that function which likewise can reduce the travel time, especially in a sequential scheduling operation. So this becomes another uh, key consideration. Not all, uh, let's say, uh, PM orders can have material uh, delivered to the job site uh, because of, let's say, safety features in the operating area but it should be considered. And as we go through uh, the development of the PM activities, you're going to find that we may not actually perform all of these tasks by the actual time on the PM work order, but they will be identified on the work order and charged to the work order. Now, uh, in the next page, on page six, we have that uh, bar or Gantt chart. And that represents the steps required in a PM work order 
in some very simplistic, uh, time-described element. The uh, first element on the left-hand side, P, is the preparation time. Uh, TT is the travel to the job site. W is the work or the wrench time. Uh, TF is travel from the job site. And C is that time which we require a contingency for delay when we first start the program. Remember I said allow about five or ten minutes for observations and findings. And at a later date, somewhere down the road, maybe about nine months to a year, that C is dropped automatically and the balance of the times are left relative to the PM work order time element. Now, moving forward into uh, pages 7A and 7B, we're going to talk about the scheduling uh, requirements relative to the shop calendar. And uh, these uh, data elements, okay, are very easy to apply. Now, easy, yes, in a, a computerized environment. Manually, we're going to have to generate some summarized uh, reports, if you will, to accomplish this. The first item indicates that we could have monthly time periods. Some people refer to those as time buckets and others as merely a time frame. That means that I could summarize all of the PMs by craft into a monthly uh, summarized time element. I could therefore take that monthly time element and then break it down into the weekly time element which is uh, identified by step two. Uh, <clears throat> this provides the ability to look out into the future, place PM, major minor overhaul, planned requirements in larger time periods. We don't have to get uh, involved in a detail relative to what day am I going to do that or maybe what week am I going to do that. Right now we're looking into larger time periods out into the future. As those time periods move closer to let's say the current schedule date like one or two weeks out, then we can get into the detail of indicating on what specific week, one or two weeks out, what specific day within that week, and what specific shift within that day we're actually going to schedule that work order. So remember, we're in a planning process. We're not in a detailed scheduling process, which is going to be uh, uh, in, in the second half of this section. Then we get into the day, as I've indicated, and then we can roll it back down into the shift. Uh, some larger companies have requirements uh, that they may do this on an annual basis. Well, in this case, you definitely need the support of computerization. You know, the CMMS applications. Uh, they can likewise be uh, summarized in semi-annually and then Item number seven uh, indicates quarterly requirements. And uh, moving to uh, page uh, 7B, the uh, last three time elements for both craft and labor planning of spare parts is basically to plan. As an example, I could issue purchase orders, uh, and if it's uh, appropriate, probably out to one year in advance. Now, People may say, well, why do you want to commit yourself to the purchase order? It's not a financial commitment. What you're doing is you're communicating to a supplier that during this time period, maybe 10 months out, during the month, let's say, of October, if I happen to be in January now, 10 months out, I'm going to require these parts by part number, description, and quantity. Now, internally, I have those parts associated with a specific PM. This is giving the supplier the lead time that he or she needs to support the scheduling system in the PM environment. Don't be afraid 
uh, to communicate your requirements out into the future time period. Remember, we have two types of planning. We have internal planning, which we're discussing up to this point, and now we're talking about spare parts planning, which is that external planning. Now we're showing you how to actually apply both of these particular planning applications. Now, moving on to uh, page number eight, as page uh, seven indicates, we have various time elements that you could plan PM work orders. Uh, these time elements should be used to determine the PM work order craft requirements, and as I said previously, also uh, the spare parts requirements. Uh, at some point in time, looking at the second paragraph, one to two years out, there will be a relationship of PM work order craft hours to the unplanned. Now, if you remember, previously I mentioned this 80, 20 percentage. Well, as you start to put more and more PM activities into the PM program, and let's say at some point in time, one to maybe two years into the uh, future, all of the assets that require preventative maintenance are going to be in the PM program. At that time, you'll be able to determine the percentage of craft hours on an annual basis, semi-annually, or whatever time period you want to analyze this as compared to the unplanned time. Uh, the rough cut, if you will, estimate and this is really based upon history, is 80-20. 80% of the time for planned requirements, 20% for unplanned. Now, as I said previously, if I'm in a continuous process, the continuous process industry, you may find that your plan requirements are going to be as high as 95%, if not higher. And that you will gain through experience. On uh, the next page, we're kind of demonstrating how those hours actually migrate from, let's say, an unplanned requirement to a planned requirement. What we're looking here is a, a typical implementation chart, but I'll show you a chart in a moment that is in greater detail than this. But the concept is, if I look at the top line, those are my total maintenance hours. Now you notice that top line starts to curve downward. It curves downward relative to the maintenance hours required. As you do more and more planning, you're going to gravitate from that 30 to 33 percent utilization today to somewhere up to about 80 to 85 percent in about a year if not longer. And that is demonstrated uh, by the PM line, which is moving from the lower left and moving upward uh, to the right. The maintenance uh, work order hours, which are really unplanned, starts to go down. You'll find at some point these lines are going to cross. And at that particular point, you're going to see that you're putting more and more hours into planning and less and less hours into unplanned requirements. My advice to you, and especially the supervisor of maintenance, is to develop some type of a graph similar to what we're looking at here. And this will prove to management graphically how well the PM program is taking hold uh, through planning and scheduling and how well the PM program is supporting the reduction of unplanned requirements. Now, uh, moving uh, forward to uh, page uh, 10A and page uh, 10B, we're going to be talking about the actual implementation of the planned requirements. So one of the first things that we want to do is kind of have a common base of discussion and to uh, uh, at least demonstrate uh, some commonality between you and me, I'm going to make an assumption that we have a, ne a net available 
planned craft capacity of 37 and a half hours uh, per week. Now, remember, we pay 40 hours. We've taken out our startup, our lunch, our, excuse me, not lunch, unless it's a three-shift operation. We've taken out the rest periods, and we've taken out the cleanup time. So out of a 40-hour week, I have 37 and a half hours of capacity available. Now, that's at 100% utilization. If you remember earlier, I indicated that you really want to determine at what percentage of that 37 and a half hours you actually want to schedule to. My advice, as I've indicated before, is start off somewhere between 45 to 50 percent and then gradually start to increase that. Now, if you happen to be one of the shops that has uh, let's say utilization of 40 to 45 percent today, then I, my recommendation is to start off around 50 to 55 percent. And continuing on in page number uh, 10B, this is really the development of moving additional craft personnel into the uh, planning and scheduling system. Now the graph that I uh, looked at earlier with you, I indicated we have another chart that is uh, covered in greater detail. And if you would turn the page, here is a implementation program for you, and it indicates that, and I'm using that 37 and a half hours again, it indicates that if I put one person in PM, I need at 100% utilization 37 and a half hours. If I put two uh, people on that uh, PM program, I'm going to have to have 37 and a half hours multiplied by two. And that's the stepping stone uh, relative to the implementation of the PM program. And again, I'm prefacing this at 100% utilization. Now, uh, you and I both know that that's somewhat re unrealistic to start off at 100%. But rather than try and give you a percentage figure to work with, I would rather use the 100% utilization and let you determine what those uh, weekly, let's say, net available capacity figures are. And they're going to be different from company to company. Now, what this chart is telling me is that you are going to have to look into the future relative to adding additional assets to the PM program. Let me uh, give you an, one basic illustration following uh, the steps of implementation of one to two to three uh, PM personnel. One person at 100% utilization requires 37 and a half hours. That means week in and week out, I'm going to have to have those PM requirements developed in advance. Now this is the lead time that I'm talking about relative to the PM program. Don't try and jump in the PM immediately without the development of the requirements of PM. Uh, remember, if I put the second person on PM, I'm going to have to double at 37 and a half hours, again at 100% utilization. What is the lead time required for the planner, schedulers, or maybe other maintenance personnel to put the PM program together? My advice is to give yourself somewhere between 60 to 90 days of lead time as you develop the PM requirements, get those requirements, uh, uh, you know, uh, rectified, reviewed, and then ultimately put those requirements on a PM worksheet, which is really the PM order. And then you're going to summarize those. And when you start to generate, let's say, 37 and a half hours of work per week, and you can look out into the future and you see over the next 60 days uh, and more that I have those 37 and a half hours of uh, P 
PM requirements. Now I'm ready to put that second person on the PM program. This is the most critical element in developing and implementing the program. Remember, planning supersedes scheduling. You've got to plan it first. When you schedule, this is the graph that you're going to be using as the implementation uh, tool, if you will. Plan first, plan out into the future, and then schedule. Scheduling is easy. It's tying in an individual with a specific work order, uh, tying in a group of people from the capacity plan with a work order, and then executing a work order. The workload is the planning process. Uh, planning is going to take some time. We may have to ask some of the people in the, in the uh, maintenance organization for some of their input relative to estimated times. Use the resources that are available. And if you do exactly what I'm trying to bring across here, plan first, execute through scheduling sec second, you will have a successful PM program. Don't let any management people try and rush you into PM. It is a planning and then secondly, a scheduling process. Now, moving into some of the documentation that may support you uh, in terms of uh, communicating the PM requirements to your uh, organization. We have listed on page 12 areas where some of that information uh, may be found. Hopefully, we have all of that data in our equipment uh, manuals. And you know, I referred to that earlier in this seminar. Uh, if we don't have it, then we're going to have to roll up our leaves and get this information. And that's the time period that I've just discussed on the previous implementation schedule. You may also require, as an example, equipment blueprints and drawings and other diagrams. Those probably are going to be needed by craft personnel on special PM applications. Third, you may have developed your own equipment manuals. Uh, the reason you did that, if you did it, is because you didn't have the OEM equipment manual. There may be what we refer to as equipment pocket guides. Uh, as an illustration, they, there may be a group of similar machines. And those pocket guides merely are giving the craft person out at the job site some additional guidance relative to some PM activities prior to actually uh, moving into the PM work order itself. Uh, and item five is written memos. Those may be some notes, if you will, that may be on the PM work order itself or a separate document for the uh, PM person to look and observe some special or unique characteristic of the asset while he or she is performing the PM uh, program. Now, Step number six uh, addresses the training seminars that may be required. Remember, if you're in a reactive environment, you don't have time to really go through a thorough analysis of how a piece of machinery or an asset should be maintained in the PM program. So in this case, while we're developing, planning, the PM requirements. This is a golden opportunity to start training those people in the craft that are going to be an integral part of the PM program. Training is so vital in the proper implementation and the execution of the PM program. And as item seven indicates, no list that anyone can provide you, including me, is ever complete. Add the additional aids that are required to support the PM craft personnel when they are ready to go to the job site. Now, uh, the PM job planning documents 
uh, that uh, we are going to look at are all noted on page number 13. Uh, we're going to look at uh, items such as a single planning document, multi-planning documents, and then also uh, the development of a, let's say a PM order where we have uh, certain information on the front of the PM order as illustrated by the second little paragraph, uh, page number 15A, and on the back there again is some additional information. That step is trying to eliminate making a paper mill out of the PM program. So if you turn now uh, to uh, page 14, let's take a look at a few of these planning documents. Now, this is the development of a PM activity for a particular asset. You don't have to utilize a form like this. Tailor it to your own specific requirement. And at some point in time, when you computerize the planning and scheduling of PM, major, minor overhaul requirements, then these documents will be printed out automatically based upon the frequency codes. Uh, up on the top, there is a title called Subject. Now, this was designed by one of uh, my clients. The subject is the asset name, the description of the asset, and also the location. And they tried to make this very simple without having three or four individual headings for that type of data. The order number is left blank until it is actually converted into an order. So this is the planning document. Uh, starting at the left and moving to the right, we have the job sequence. The sequence number, or the operation number, as I've indicated before, is in straight numerical sequences by units of measure of one. The description of the work is identified in the second column from the left. Now, under manpower planning, we have the craft requirements, and here you could either use the code or use the description plus the code. And uh, we have the number of craft required and then the estimated time per uh, sequence or operation. And it is that estimated time by sequence and operation that gives us the ability to do a better job of estimating the time and then at some point in time we will total those up and down at the bottom of that particular uh, column under estimated time, we could have a summary. Now, let's take a look at those four basic time elements. I have preparation time, which is the first operation. Then I'll have the estimate for that, the estimated time. The second is travel to the job site. I'm going to have that time element. The third are the different sequences or steps when I actually perform the PM activity. We're going to have individual times for that, but we want to summarize that third major step. Then we're going to have the uh, uh, fourth step, which is travel from the uh, job site. It will have its time element, and the summary that I'm speaking of is merely to summarize those four total time elements by the four major activities. Now, the column on the right-hand side addresses the material required, the special tools, the equipment, and the documentation. And some planner schedulers will actually put the spare part numbers right in with the sequence number that that part is, a part is going to be used in. They will likewise indicate by sequence or operation number what the tool is going to require or what special equipment is going to be required or even documentation. So what we're really doing is laying out the road map in great detail for the PM inspector. Take the time up front to do the planning uh, in the detail and the execution, the time on the job will become less and less. Now, moving to the next uh, document, we have a different detailed work order plan. And this is the one that has two uh, sides to it. 15A is the front side, 
uh, and 15B uh, is the back side of the form. Now again, I'm not going to spend the time going through each and every item here. They're self-explanatory. It's very similar to what we've identified before, except here you will notice that down at the bottom of uh, the front page, page 15A, we have parts required. Now, that means that if the parts are identified on the work order, then I could give that work order to the uh, storeroom, the crib, okay, and they could fill those parts, pull the parts, and apply them to this order, and they actually have uh, the opportunity to put the bin location here. If, on the other hand, uh, a item was not available, we could indicate who the vendor is and any other information on here. So we're tying together those four major timing elements. That is planning and scheduling, uh, the inventory system, the purchasing system, and the storeroom. Now at some point in time as we do more and more planning, we're going to be purchasing spare parts for specific uh, planned uh, maintenance PM orders. There are going to be some items as we discussed in section 4 when we were in the inventory management application that some items are going to be purchased through the EOQ and those would be in the storeroom and subsequently applied to PM work orders. Now turning to page 15B, uh, these steps here uh, represent the safety features that must be followed by the PM person. Uh, and remember I indicated earlier one of the first steps as far as the work is concerned is the lockout requirements. That would mean if I have a lockout process that is an integral part of issuing a tool out of uh, the, the uh, maintenance crib would be a lock itself uh, depending on the type of lockout with the various tags that are associated with it. So if a PM is being accomplished by a PM operator, if you will, no one can inadvertently start that asset in terms of operation. You'll notice that there are additional uh, signatures required and those uh, pertain uh, to the lockout itself, the authorization, of operations personnel uh, to unlock the procedure uh, with the maintenance person, start up the piece of machinery, make sure it's in operating condition. All of those steps are an integral part of step number three, the work that has to be accomplished. Now, getting into the detail of scheduling, once the planning process has been completed, we now want to schedule the work order. Uh, there are different approaches to scheduling. And what I've done at the bottom of page uh, 16A, I've kind of listed for you different approaches to scheduling. If I issue one order at a time, which item one illustrates, then that means that that uh, PM person is going to utilize all of those travel times and all of the work time. Remember, the first sequence should be performed by the storeroom. The second step illustrates that you could batch. Batching is adding two or more work orders together. Now, when I consider that, I have to consider how I'm going to execute the batching process. That means that the uh, craft person may go to the storeroom and the storeroom is going to give that person all of the work orders that are going to be scheduled that day including all of the uh, equipment, uh, the spare parts, the tooling and documentation. Now here's where we have to kind of use a little common sense. How is that craft person going to convey uh, those work orders and all of that material to the various job sites. Here is where you have to consider to mechanize 
uh, the uh, PM activity. Uh, some individuals have uh, manual pull carts. Uh, some have uh, mechanized uh, mobile, if you will, uh, trucks, either run by propane or battery. It depends upon your environment. Others have tricycles with a, a little uh, four-wheel dolly on the back. Uh, I've seen it, uh, you know, in just about every type of a conveyance. This is something that you have to consider when you start to batch scheduling and batch releasing orders. There are two types of scheduling requirements, as I indicated before. Item three demonstrates the scheduling uh, called sequential, two or more orders. And the fourth element is sequential scheduling. Now we have some diagrams uh, that we'll look at very shortly that indicates the difference between uh, sequential scheduling and overlap scheduling. Uh, an item or page number uh, 16B, uh, we're talking about the key considerations of scheduling PM orders in a manufacturing environment. If the PM work orders are identified as static and dynamic, then these work orders can be uh, commingled with the production work orders. And uh, again, uh, this may seem like a duplication of uh, data that I've uh, reviewed with you earlier. It isn't. It's merely an indication to, again, fortify the uh, requirement of separating the PM work order into static or dynamic. And again, uh, the last paragraph indicates that both the production schedule and the maintenance schedule at some point in time can be totally integrated uh, into one scheduling environment. And that is accomplished by following my ground rules relative to planning and scheduling. Plan out into the future, but only schedule one, maybe no more than two weeks in advance. Now, starting off on page 17a, uh, we're going to talk about sequential scheduling and overlap sequential scheduling. And as, as I indicated, uh, we do a lot of cross-referencing uh, for you. And uh, what I want to do at this point in time, rather than try and walk through and read 17A and 17B, I am going to move over uh, to page 18. That's the diagram that I talked about. And as I go through my discussion, I'm going to cover all the data uh, that is on pages 17a and 17b. Now, uh, page 18, as the title indicates, is sequential scheduling. And again, let me reiterate, sequen sequential scheduling is to schedule two or more orders in sequence. Here, over a period of time, we have actually scheduled three individual orders. Now you notice uh, there are some uh, slack times between the first and second PM order and likewise between the second and third orders. Uh, we call that uh, lost time. Actually, the orders when you schedule them sequentially should be abutted to each other. So the key for the planner scheduler to successfully schedule sequentially is to eliminate any of those LTs between two and between the, the second and the third order. The other uh, data that is on the individual orders we had uh, discovered that previously. I have left out C, that contingency for delay for uh, these illustrations. But again, P, the prep time that's done by the uh, crib. And uh, it also uh, illustrates that if it's done by the crib, that material could be delivered to the job site 
uh, to save uh, additional uh, travel time for that uh, PM operator to come back to the crib and get the second and subsequently the third order. But here's the important point. The total time on these three orders is going to be charged to the job. Now, I said earlier that I'll show you how to earn more work order hours through the PM scheduling system by putting in actually less time on the job. And that is uh, developed for you on page 19. This is what we call sequential overlap scheduling. I've taken the same three orders on uh, page number uh, 18. They are, if you want to measure them with a ruler or whatever, you'll see they're the same time elements. Except what I've done is I'm overlapping those non-productive or non-wrench time times. So what we're doing is uh, for the first order, you notice that P is to the left of the starting time. That means that the storeroom actually had that order prepared the day in advance. And that is part of the planning of the storeroom. The uh, individual uh, that's going to perform that particular PM uh, will get his or her material and travel to the job site. Now, if I take the sequential schedules and I do an overlap, that means that I'm going to save the travel from and the travel to that total elapsed time and save some of that portion by merely traveling from one job site to another. That's the key for successful reduction, okay, of total PM time, but still generating and charging to the job the total time that that job was estimated to have. Now, going all the way over to the right-hand side, You'll notice that we have a time period uh, that is actually saved through sequential overlap scheduling. What do you think we're going to do with that time? Why not put a fourth work order in there? Schedule a fourth work order through overlap sequential scheduling. Now, you're not going to find, to the best of my knowledge, this type of an application in any textbook uh, and it's really not instituted in many many companies that's something like I said we've developed we've helped uh, help companies implement and I guarantee if you do this you're going to generate more earn time with actual less hours going into the job and that's the key